Namaste. I would like to go into the mantra that when translated to English, translates as, in spite of appearances, everything is unfolding perfectly. In one of the languages of this galaxy, this mantra is sounded as Natiya Sange Utima Utima. Natiya Sange Utima Utima. Natiya Sange Utima Utima. I want to first break down the mantra into its component pieces and to put them together into an understanding of what it means and why it is um, a useful thought to hold in your consciousness. There was a Dzogchen Buddhist master in Tibet that went into his rainbow body in 1956 before 50 witnesses had all the signs of accomplishment of rainbows appearing in the sky and the body uh, shrinking to nothing before the 50 witnesses and he was um, a silent Lama. By technical terms, he was not a Lama at all. He was not a Lama by title, but by the level of realization that he carried and lived. His mantra when he was going into the transformation of the rainbow body was, in spite of appearances, everything is unfolding perfectly. He did share it slightly differently when it's translated. I see everything is, is an illusion, and yet everything is unfolding perfectly. And he kept repeating the Tibetan equivalent of this gently over and over again in his mind, and through this was able to dissolve all the hindrances to full awakening into the rainbow body or the light body. And one of the lamas who was witnessing that burst into tears because he was um, ashamed that he was not able to perceive the level of development of this practitioner, that this master was a hidden master who was actually a stone cutter by profession, cutting stones for building um, houses and temples. And this stone cutter profession uh, has an inner side and an outer side. The outer side is that the stones are cut, chipped away. And the other side of it is the inner side or inner practice of even cutting stones. When Padmasambhava goes into his rainbow body uh, yoga, at one point he takes his hand and pushes his hand into a stone and leaves a handprint. The handprint can still be seen near Maratiki Cave where Padmasambhava and Mandarava did their dual yoga for the attainment of rainbow body. Part of the teaching that is behind this transformation is the teaching that also is embodied in the Uttara Tantra, that everything is Buddha nature and everything is a manifestation or a dream in consciousness. That the, the entire universe is not made out of a substance called matter but is a dream in consciousness that is always dependent on the dreamer for its dependent existence. That the manifest universe does not have what is called um, intrinsic existence. Intrinsic existence would mean 
that it was existent from its own side or from its own energy and does not need the support of anything to continue to exist. Dependent existence, or what is called the realization of emptiness, is that what we call matter is dependent on consciousness and cannot exist independently of consciousness, which is the opposite belief that a lot of science is still based on, that there's this thing called consciousness and it cannot affect matter directly because um, matter exists independently of consciousness. That means consciousness cannot really directly influence matter. And this leads ultimately to the um, view that has been called central state materialism, that consciousness is an epiphenomena of matter. In other words, it's reversed. That consciousness is dependent on brain activity to exist, and therefore is dependent on material functions or matter functions to have any kind of existence at all. And then when matter is destroyed or restructured, so it does not support the appearance of consciousness, then consciousness ceases to exist. The Chittamatra school of, of Tibetan Buddhism, which some people feel is the highest expression of Buddhist philosophy, declares the opposite, that everything is dependent on consciousness, and that consciousness is one. There is a universal consciousness that permeates all of space and all of time and all of matter and all of energy that is at the heart of this universe and that the universe that we see, the manifest universe, is dependent on this universal consciousness, not the other way around. That the whole universe can cease to exist when universal consciousness ceases to dream it. And therefore, one of the uh, shifts that occurs in enlightenment is where we reverse our hidden belief that matter is real and consciousness isn't to the other way around, that matter is unreal and consciousness is real and only consciousness truly exists, that what we call the material universe is a dream in consciousness. And even while consciousness is dreaming the dream, the dream is nothing but consciousness. In the same way that at night, everything in the dream is something we dream into existence. And as soon as we cease to dream it, it ceases to exist immediately. So this is the first foundation of understanding, in spite of appearances, everything is unfolding perfectly. That is the first part of it. And that is what may be called monism at the heart of that. Monism is the, the feeling and realization that whatever is called God is all there is. Only God is. Only consciousness is. And that is the monistic vision at the heart of it. There's another uh, philosophical school that is called pantheism which is the belief that everything is God, that the entire manifest universe is, is God. And what may be possible to understand in the unity of consciousness is that what we call pantheism is a realization that the manifest universe is God and what we call monism is a realization that whatever God is, is one pure unity uh, with no duality whatsoever. It's sometimes called pure monism or pure non-duality. I'd like you to feel that both viewpoints are true on an intellectual level. And when you go into pure consciousness, you realize it directly. Uh, beyond words, beyond thoughts, and beyond concepts. And that is the first of three enlightenments that is possible to attain. 
inside of monism is what I would call sacred individuality, which is all of us. If you can hear this um, recording or transmission, that means you are sentient, you are a sacred individual, and as such, you are endowed with creative freedom or free choice. You can create your life by one choice after another. And every day, every moment, we're making choices to, um, to grow, to do things. It could be as simple as a choice to buy one thing off of a menu at a restaurant versus another. But we're making thousands and thousands of choices. And if you think about every single thought that you have in your consciousness as a choice, we're making billions of choices every day. And we're having choices on the level of thought, choices on the level of emotion, and choices on the level of the body about what to do with the bodies that we in inhabit. And all those choices that sacred individuals have with each other forms the universe that we experience. The monistic core through its pantheistic expression uh, does the macro dream. And we as sacred individuals do the dreams within the dream that are called our bodies and our life. And our interactions with each other um, form yet another level of dreaming. It is like playing a video game where, where multiple players are interacting with each other through the medium of the video game, which is having impartial rules that govern all the transactions within its field. In Santana Dharma, or ancient Hinduism, this uh, planet is called a field of karma. It doesn't mean a field of punishment. It feel, what it means is there is cause and effect in, in mediating all the uh, choices we make when we respond to each other. Another metaphor that is good to understand is a metaphor of a game where people are making moves on the same board and interacting with each other through uh, the game. The game is the matrix of law, the laws of the macrocosm. And what I'd like to share on this level, this is the level of, I'm going to call it monistic realization, Everything is unfolding perfectly. There is never a violation of anything going on. It doesn't mean we can't make mistakes. We can and do make mistakes all the time. We're free to make them. And nothing can stop us from making the mistakes because our free choice is that free. Um, it does mean, though, when people make various mistakes, universal law mediates there and comes to a perfect expression of all the inputs or choices all the beings make in this matrix. And so we generate through these thoughts um, the universe that we experience. And human beings experience the universe in a different way from all the other animal species. The very first sermon of Gautama Buddha, the first public sermon, not his sermon to the five sannyasins who were his friends, but his first sermon in public, is starts with, um, what we are arises with our thoughts, and with our thoughts we make our world. And he goes on deeper and deeper from there. He focuses on the creative principle that we have free choice on the level of our thoughts. And with those thoughts, we make our world. And universal law allows our thoughts to manifest and create our life. And also universal law, when we learn to make better choices, will reflect those back to us. This is called a mirror-like wisdom in the five dhyana Buddha mandala, where there are these expressions there where if you want to understand your karma, see it as a mirror of all the choices you've made. 
your bad choices don't punish you. Your good choices don't reward you. They simply manifest what you're creating. And that's why in a higher Buddhists and a lot of higher lamas, don't, they don't really use the word bad anymore. They use the word, words either unskillful or afflicted instead. Afflicted means uh, suffering. And there's two kinds of suffering, the suffering of cause and the suffering of result, which means that there are sufferings that are a result of our choices and there are sufferings that inspire us to make choices. When we choose in an angry state, anger itself, if you inspect it very carefully, is a form of suffering. The moment we choose to be angry, the very moment we choose to be angry, we suffer. And if we make choices from anger, we create resultant suffering as well which is suffering of result. If we um, make angry choices, get into a fight, then end up in a hospital, all those are resultant suffering from the choice to fight in anger with somebody else. When Padmasambhava taught the nature of suffering, he focused very deeply on that there was uh, suffering even in the cause of suffering, which is the choice to be angry, or the choice to be afraid, or the choice to be sad. We do not normally see these as choices, and they are, in a sense, results of other choices. When we identify with our anger and make it our own again, we renew our connection with anger and keep manifesting it again. And that creates a karma path. And all the karma paths interacting with each other are behind, for instance, all the wars on the planet that occur where people are, are, are choosing to join in the stream. In the outer world, in the world of appearances, it looks like the war is unjust, that one side is the victim of the other side. And in one sense that is true, the outer conventional interpretation in the world of appearances has some validity to it. The deeper level is that there is a stream of cause and effect below the surface, cause and effect, and our choices to link with certain causes and certain effects to amplify them. That results in a manifestation in the universe of a karmic activity. Um, war is such an activity. And there are billions of causes flowing through the stream of time that create a war. Um, and even the choice of having a ruler and following a ruler is part of it. So a ruler eventually commands an army and the army obeys and is even willing to obey up into the point of killing uh, people on the other side of the battlefield. And so it is a convergent phenomena. Millions upon millions of causes are flowing together to create a war. And that war is arising in the field of universal law and karma and is playing out. And everyone has secretly chosen to be on the battlefield and they have long ago forgotten the choices they've made to be there. They long ago forgotten that they made a choice to reincarnate. They long ago forgot all these choices. And just because they forgot the choices doesn't mean they are responsible or ir not responsible for those choices. If you sign a, um, a contract and forget you signed it, that contract is still valid until you, rem you take ownership of that contract and choose to acquit the contract consciously. And so one of the things that arises in discussion is that um, when people say they don't remember their past lifetimes, and indeed they, they don't remember that, there's a certain point in the process of incarnation 
where people do choose to go unconscious or choose to forget the choices they made to choose uh, what's called a womb entrance into a world. And usually the um, quality of their choices are what might be called automatic habits. Automatic habits are choices we habitually made over and over again till they began to occur by momentum. In other words, we keep making the same choices uh, over and over again until we, we make habitual choices. And those habitual choices we can do even when we're unconscious. And those habitual choices are usually what bring people into incarnation. So people are not fully conscious even when they're in the bardo deciding which way to go in the bardo. Usually their automatic habits um, run them in the bardo. And so one of the secrets that one of my teachers taught me is the best thing to do on the level that we are operating on normally is to start to create conscious habits and habits that work in every, um, they work directly with universal law and they, uh, they are aligned with Dharma as it's called. A habit that's aligned with Dharma acknowledges what I'm sharing as an outline that you acknowledge that only consciousness exists and it's one universal consciousness that we are all a part of and we make sure every thought that we generate in our conscious ritual or conscious habit is aligned with it so we can keep renewing our contact with the sacred until it becomes a habit that replaces all our unconscious automatic habits of creating suffering for ourselves. till we release all those. Our automatic habits are our root karmas that we must learn to let go of. And the idea is we keep surrendering the habits into the purifying fire of re and um, burn them away. And at the same time, we do conscious ritual until it purifies all our unconscious habits. So in the meditations that I am sharing, it is a conscious ritual to dissolve all our unconscious habits. The perpetuation of is our, our repetitive karma patterns, our cyclic existence, where we automatically run habits through death and rebirth and keep repeating the same basic pattern of life and the same basic pattern of karma from lifetime to lifetime until we get sick and tired of being sick and tired and choose to follow the path to awakening to lift ourselves out of repetitive cyclic existence into full awakening. Now most people do not fully do everything with 100% repetition. Deep down people are making small choices here and there to liberate themselves. Usually it's not enough to awaken oneself, but it is a start. Every single good choice you make or wholesome choice you make will liberate you in a tiny little way. And every choice to live from suffering and create more suffering binds you deeper. And so in a way the balance between the two is computed by universal law and keeps manifesting new patterns of life. And because other people are also changing around you, the outer patterns do change to reflect that. And the, out, the inner consistency of what we're choosing from creates the, the compulsive round of karmas. So that is roughly what's going on, which means that everything is unfolding perfectly. The very experience of suffering that people are going through will eventually make people choose to go beyond suffering. So suffering leads you beyond suffering, therefore everything is unfolding perfectly. The first part of the mantra, in spite of appearances, invites us to look deeper than a conventional interpretation and awareness of what is going on, to look deeper than the news um, that you're watching, to look deeper, to see the flow of choice, cause, and effect 
in the stream of life and how these interactions are occurring and how if you are a being that's growing through your experience and making better and better choices then things will keep unfolding perfectly to the point where people will choose to undergo light body yoga and complete the last part of their process. And so this is what I wanted to share as a basic understanding um, to explain the mantra. And one more thing is that if you gently repeat in spite of appearances, everything is unfolding perfectly and keep chanting it um, 1,000 times, an inner feeling of the wisdom core of the mantra will manifest in your consciousness. And this will allow you to um, directly intuit and feel the principle uh, that is behind it and begin to see and feel when you're looking at the news and all these things, the hidden matrix of law that is governing those interactions. Now, one advisory thing that when you're looking at the news, you are hearing the news filtered through a lot of reporters and newscasters who are getting reports from politicians. All of them are adding their layers of interpretation uh, to the events. And if they do not believe everything's unfolding perfectly, their interpretations are going to reflect those imbalances. However, if you open up to a level of silence inside yourself, the monistic core can illuminate what's going on and show you how everything's unfolding perfectly. And you can experience that as a healing movement within yourself. Because when you feel everything's unfolding perfectly, you can relax into the process of living and enjoy the process of awakening. Namaste, um, many blessings, and I'm going to be doing a few more of these transmissions as a background for understanding the meditations that I wish to share on my uh, YouTube channel. Blessings.